The Old Testament reading is from Jeremiah chapter 9, beginning at verse 12. Who is the man so wise that he can understand this? To whom has the mouth of the Lord spoken that he may declare it? Why is the land ruined and laid waste like a wilderness so that no one passes through? And the Lord says, Because they have forsaken my law that I have set before them and have not obeyed my voice or walked in accord with it, but have stubbornly followed their own hearts and have gone after the Baals as their father taught them, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed this people with bitter food and give them poisonous water to drink. I will scatter them among the nations whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. O Lord, have mercy on us. The epistle reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving God, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regardless of the faith. They will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. A reading from St. Matthew, the 26th chapter. When Jesus had finished all, saying all these things, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar amongst the people. O Lord, have mercy on us. Dear friends in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this morning's sermon is from the last two verses of 7 and 8. All my enemies whisper together against me. They imagine the worst for me, saying, A vile disease has afflicted him. He will never get up from the place where he lies. These two verses show us that sometimes God's silence is holy and horrifying. There was a cell phone commercial, maybe you've seen it, it showed a father who was sitting in the silence of his living room. The movements of the cars going by, the sound of the environment seemed much louder that day because he was waiting in silent agony for his daughter to call him. She had just left and was making her way to college. She had her phone and everything. She was ready for this trip. He knew she was ready and prepared but still, that silence of not knowing gave him a fear. That sweet ding that everybody has on their iPhone that you and I check because we have the same ringtone was the music to his ears. It was a melody. It cut the silence and it told the father that she had made it to the school. Sometimes, Silence is holy and horrifying. For King David, God's silence and the whispers around him were that. It wasn't always a good thing. They were of horror. He whispered to his general to have his most loyal soldier, Uriah, be placed on the front line and killed so that King David could selfishly and sinfully have Bathsheba as his wife. God was silent after he pronounced judgment on the child that Bathsheba bore him and when he became sick. 
King David's servants whispered out of fear after the child died. And now, once again, his enemies were whispering about him, hatred and plotting his death. They were imagining the worst for King David. And God's silence in this time was horrifying because he knew that God knew what he had done. And David was sitting in that silent agony, awaiting for his trial. God's silence is horrifying in these two verses because it's mixed with the whisper of hatred when his enemies imagined and plotted for his death. But on the same token, God's silence is horrifying, but it's holy at the same time because King David was sure and he knew that he rested in the vi- verdict of a, ju- of a just God. While he was still in his sickbed, they came to visit him and spoke empty words. Then they went out into the town square to spread rumors and plotted against the worst possible way for him to fall so that he wouldn't be able to get up from where he lay. Yet in this quiet moment of horror, King David was able to cut through the silence. He prays to a holy God and seeks refuge in him. During my second year of seminary, we had a field trip to a monastery that was not too far from where uh, Clayton was. The head monk came out to greet us because he knew we were coming that day. And he showed us around the, the monastery and he brought us into the sanctuary so that we could experience what a prayer life of a monk looks like. As he sat us down, the timer started. It was a holy thing to do, to sit there in silence and pray. But the silence was so intense that it made you feel horrible and uncomfortable because you couldn't sit still for more than five minutes. God's silence can be that horrifying too. It can be horrifying to you and me because sometimes it doesn't seem like God knows what he's doing or he's aware of where we are in the pew. As we wait, the silence is noisy, they say. When God is silent, it speaks volumes. It speaks volumes to those who mock us and ask, where is your God? If your God really is the God of who he says he is, then why are all these things happening to you? Why do things like this happening around the world if your God is in control? It can be horrifying because it always seems that the holy ones are being hurt while God's enemies are getting away with everything. Vile acts. You know this because maybe there's that coworker who just can't stand you or any other Christian in the office and makes it difficult What they say is horrible. It keeps you at a distance. It keeps you in silence as you wonder, when will God act? Maybe you have a family member or even a friend, a neighbor even, that threatens to end every conversation and relationship if you dare bring up one more thing about Jesus. You also wonder, when will God cut through this silence and speak to them? Dear friends, know this. God's silence is holy to you, but it will be a horror for those who speak evil about you, revile you on Christ's name's sake, and refuse to forgive you, and wish the worst upon you. God's silence is holy and horrifying because he's planning his vindication, meaning that God is planning a time when he will make everything that was wrong right again. God's silence is holy and horrifying because on Good Friday, he abandoned his one and only son, Jesus, at the cross. He allowed for the enemies of death and Satan to have victory for these three days. God's silence allowed Jesus to become sin itself. And when he was crucified to the cross, he was the thief on the cross, the murderer and the adulterer. Jesus even cried out, My God, why have you forsaken me? God did not answer. But we know that even in the death and even in the silence of the tomb, death 
does not have the final say. Jesus speaks. His enemies' minor victories will be short-lived because Jesus will descend into hell and proclaim victory to the death. And he will rise again on the third day. And in that same way, Jesus will raise you up on the last day. He gave up his life to claim yours so that you would never have to experience the horror of God's silence. The day of the resurrection is a promise to you. It's a promise of that day of vindication where all the wrongs that have been done to you will be made right before the Lord. And as you sit in this silence of holy horror, be comforted that God is pulling you closer and closer to him and into his holy silence. Your baptism reminds you of this. You were baptized into Jesus' name and his death and his resurrection. His words are holy because they were a promise that were made to you that remains true forevermore. These words you can always turn to and look back upon when you face the holy horror of silence. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen.